Welcome, everybody. We'll give it another minute or two for people to join. Um, everyone is placed on mute. If you want to use the chat box to the right of your screen just to say a little hello, that would be great. I've just talked about some downloads and slides that Jason will be referencing today. So if you want to go ahead and click on that useful document. Welcome to just joining. We're just going to give it another minute or so. Um, everyone's please to mute for this webinar today. And please use the chat box if you want to make a little hello. Um, that would be great. Thanks, that should be good. I've just muted the other microphones. Does that sound a little bit better? Great. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started today. Welcome and thank you all so much for your interest and coming along to the Tasmanian Timber webinar series featuring Responsible Wood today. To start us out, we have Michael Lee. He's from the Center for Sustainable Architecture with Wood at the University of Tasmania. And that will be followed with Jason Lee, and he's the Marketing Communication Officer at Responsible Wood. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So as I mentioned, everyone is placed on me. Please utilize that chat box for any questions that come up during the presentation. And Michael and Jason will address those all at the end the end of the session. And the webinar today will also be recorded. So if you'd like to watch any section of the presentation or if you wanted to share it with any colleagues, we'll send a link after the presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Without further ado, I'll pass things off to Michael Lee. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, nice to see so many online and uh, nice to have Jason with us. Um, just, just as Morgan said, if you've got uh, any questions, just please pop them up in the chat. Jason and I'll try and answer. And uh, I know, I know, we both are, are not adverse to uh, stopping and having, you know, explaining things if there's any questions. So just pop them up. I'd just like to just start off with uh, just reminding everyone we have a Taz Timber website. We've got a one three hundred expert line, and if you've got any questions. Um, either on this or sustainability or Tasmanian timbers, please give us a call or drop us a line on that, Any, you know, especially specifics, so we can uh, get you some answers back. One of the things uh, we're going to be talking about today is, you know, the difference between um, the certification in, in the terrestrial forests, like as you can see here, our, our beautiful regenerated forest or our plantations as, as opposed to the uh, the timber that's coming out of the lake from hydro wood which is a, a gorgeous gorgeous um, product in its own right so yeah I'm not going to keep you very long guys I'd just like to just share with you a very one minute long video from uh, that was taken of James Fitzpatrick when he was down here just from a designer's point of view, looking at the forest. So if, hopefully I can, uh, I, I can get this knowledge to and a good understanding run. Timber and how it's used. But really, I think this showed how little knowledge I did have and how some of that knowledge was actually wrong. So it was a real eye-opening experience. There's a huge percentage of the state that is locked away and appropriately so. And there's this regenerative sector, which was a completely new one for us. We all assumed there was old growth 
and then we thought there was plantation. We didn't realise there's another subset in the middle, regrowth, which is actually creating new bushland that's left for you know 100 years before it's reharvested. And then to find that one of the forests we're walking through was actually been harvested already two times before. And also just meeting some of the foresters that are actually looking after these forests that they won't be harvested in their lifetime. So they're actually creating an asset for a future generation. So that was a really fascinating story, which I didn't know and didn't understand. And then to be able to pass that through to our clients, it just gives you that quite confidence that, oh, I am doing the right thing. This is appropriate. This is the best solution moving forward. Yeah, look, I think I think that puts it in, in a great deal of context. Um, so at this point, you know, again, happy to answer questions, and I'm sure Jason and I will try and keep an eye on the chat box as we're going through, and we leave sufficient time at the end. Um, but yeah, if you miss anything, or if you want to come back with questions, get a copy, please jump onto the website and have a look. So at this point, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Jason. Is Jason Ross. I'm the Marketing and Communications Officer for Responsible Wood, uh, which is the old Australian forestry standard. So, um, okay, let's try to break the ice a bit with having some question and answers. Um, I've just got to um, see if I can, um, there we go. So, um, I've got on the side, on the poll section of the presentation, we've got some questions and answers that I'd love to get some um, feedback from you guys to get a bit of context about what's going on and your understanding of forest certification and can sort of drive through this presentation. So I might just ask Morgan if uh, if she's fantastic. So I'd like to get your thoughts. Have you heard of PEFC, FSC, yes to both or no to either? It'd be very interesting to see what sort of response we get from everyone in the audience today. So uh, I presume it's we're getting pretty favourably there. There's yes to both. Fantastic, fantastic. Now I have your attention. Um, did you know the principles of forest certification across both PSC and FSC are born from the process known as the Montreal process in 1994, which was a commitment from a range of different countries to set criteria for sustainable forest management. PSC by itself covers more than 75% of all forests certified around the world that meet forest certification. I'd like to move on to the second question, um, if I can, um, and that is, um, the response would scheme. Um, do you, um, Morgan, have you got that second question? Fantastic. Uh, response would mean, so have you heard of response would before and what does it mean to you? So if I could get everyone to answer any of these questions, if you don't know what the, it is, that's fantastic as well. Um, it'd be interesting to see what you sort of, sort of what the first thing that springs to mind when you think about responsible wood, which is the Australian forest, uh, it's the Australian national governing body for PFC in Australia. Fantastic. Um, well, actually, if you've answered any of those, it's correct. So Responsible Wood uh, ensures that forests meet environmental standards, it supports renewable forests, and it's also Australian. So Responsible Wood by itself is um, the PFC scheme in Australia. If you see a Responsible Wood logo on a product, it means that it uh, is endorsed by PFC. It's, uh, it follows the Australian Standard for Sustainable Forest Management, and it has a chain of custody through Australian processing as well. So um, that's all good to know. So that's a nice little icebreaker to sort of look at um, responsible wood certification and PFC generally. So uh, as we sort of looked at, uh, forest certification is used to verify that all timber and paper is sourced from forests that meet sustainable benchmarks. Uh, it can be used to demonstrate timber legality and is used by a range of different building schemes within Australia and indeed around the world. Um, globally, as we've looked at before, PSC and FSC are the two dominant global certification schemes. And around, this is quite a, an outdated slide at the moment, actually, because now up to 75% of all global certified forests are covered by PFC. Uh, and what's quite unique about that is if you look at certification globally in terms of the global footprint across total forest area, only around 11% of total forests uh, are actually covered um, under, the, under either PFC or FSC or indeed both. So one of the challenges that we face at Responsible Wood at PEFC is trying to lift the amount of forest area around the world that's covered through forest certification. And indeed in Australia, uh, Responsible Wood is the national governing body 
and our scheme meets the Australian standard for sustainable forest management, as well as an associated chain of custody. So that's quite important to know. Um, I've got a few um, interesting different um, videos that we can look at in a second, but I'd like to look at the process of endorsement and recognition. So Responsible Wood is the national governing body, as I mentioned before, we have the Australian standards. Uh, in order to achieve PSC certification, we have this process known of mutual recognition and international endorsement. And that process is that we develop a standard in Australia and in New Zealand. We have to send that um, standard off to the PSC Council, where they've set an, um, an international benchmark under which both standards must meet to um, achieve international endorsement. And through a process of um, um, reviewing and auditing our standard to ensure that it has a baseline meta requirement, uh, unless we meet those requirements, we indeed will not get PFC endorsement as well, which is quite important. And in certification of compliance against these standards is carried out by an independent third party certification body. And there are a range of different certification bodies on our site. And indeed, Responsible Wood is actually a campaign associate of the Australian Made and Grown uh, scheme as well. So um, if you see a Responsible Wood product, uh, logo on a product, it, it, it ensures that the, the timber is sourced from an Australian forest and supports the chain of custody as well, which is relatively important. So thank you very much. Um, so I've got a nice little video here that looks at PEFC in a, in a global context and why it's important and what we're all about. So I'd like to play this video now, um, if I can. And you said common DNA. They understand that this is all about caring for the forests. People who are involved with the PFC are very passionate about delivering sustainable forest management. And they share a lot of information, they exchange a lot of ideas, and it really feels like a family when you're working together with colleagues from different countries, because we all have the same goals in our minds, in our everyday work. As with all families, there are, of course, disagreements. There can, of course, be uh, quite strong disagreements between members at times, but we all have a common bond. And our common bond is that we want to achieve sustainable forest management and do the right thing. We want to achieve sustainable forest management. We want to make sure that what we are doing locally and nationally is sustainable. And we want to help others around the world who have similar aspirations achieve their goals as well. So it really is a family. So we have the privilege of working with nature. We have the best jobs in the world. through on the chat line as well, which is terrific. So uh, Joshua, just going through the question around full regrowth of a forest. Well, it ultimately it depends on what type of forest it actually is. So under our scheme, and we'll go through this, uh, we'll go through this further during the presentation, but you've got a plantation forest, which could have a 30 year life cycle on a regrowth of a forest. And you might have a native forest, which might have a much longer regrowth as well. Uh, and uh, part of that process is actually looking at the forest management plan, which is encapsulated as a requirement in our standards to ensure that a forest policy and a forest management plan is um, developed, adopted and implemented by the forest manager as well. And also, um, also for Robert, um, absolutely, we have AS4708 and 4707 actually included in the handout. So if I could probably go through and explain how those work. So in the top of the chat, you've got the chat, the polls and the handouts. In the handouts, um, we've also included, uh, which Morgan's included very generously, um, a list of, of, of required handouts that we've provided for this presentation. And in that, you've got the responsible wood standards and the PFC standards. Within the responsible wood standards, you've got um, the AS4708 and AS4707 as well. So um, happily to answer any questions further to that further during the presentation. Otherwise, if you're having trouble accessing those docs, very happy to send them through as well. So um, fantastic. So I might jump through to the rest of my presentation. Um, so again, in terms of polls, because I'm just trying to keep this as engaged as possible, I thought I'd probably share a couple of interesting insights of the benefits of sustainable forest management indeed for the people and the planet. So um, 
So yeah, so let's move on along to why forests actually matter. Um, so the next question I'd like to ask everyone on the on the poll today is um, true or false? Forests play a crucial role in the water world's water supplies. It does it indeed play a crucial role. So I might jump down and see what everyone thinks. Um, I guess given that the the type of audience we have today and what I'm talking about, it's a bit of a stack deck. Uh, and indeed, everyone's answered true, and that is indeed correct. Uh, what you perhaps didn't know is that 75% of the global water supply is sourced from forest catchments. Um, and that's quite interesting. Indeed, in the slide I've, I've provided here, it actually <laughs> lists out that forest catchments supply 75% of the world's water supply. And indeed, forests are very vital for, water so for the water cycle. They slow down water for and filter the water that enters the rivers. They also transpire water into the atmosphere, contributing to the formulation of clouds and water. And okay, now let's move on to a specific series of questions. Uh, and that's the next question as well. Um, if I can, how much water um, can a large oak tree transfer into, into the atmosphere in a year? Um, so um, I'm very interested to see what people's thoughts are in terms of where that sits. Fantastic, so we've got a bit of a We've got a bit of a uh, a bit of a um, a sort of a split between fifteen hundred liters and one hundred and fifty one thousand liters, and indeed, if you answered one hundred and fifty one thousand, you'd be correct, which is incredible. And on average, forty percent of rainfall over land originates from the extra transportation from plants. In some areas, it's even higher, which is quite remarkable. Um, so stay with me, guys. We've got a few questions to go before we jump into the rest of the presentation. Um, True or false? Again, uh, forests can clean and filter water that rely on on forests for their uh, for their water supply. Have we got that question there, or we've jumped further to another question? Okay. So, what percentage of the people in the world rely on forests for their water supply? Um, fantastic. Right, for those that answered 76%, you are correct. As you can see, forests do play a very important role in how we operate beyond the forest as well, which is quite interesting. And you look at the globalized impacts of that. Uh, and the next question I'd like to ask is, um, how many of the world's largest cities rely on protected forests for much of their drinking water? Okay, um, we may have skipped along another question, which is fine. Um, so where are we at there? Fantastic. So seems everyone's on the right page today, which is terrific. Around one third of all cities um, actually rely on protected forests for much of their drinking water. And those include New York, Tokyo and Barcelona and many cities here in Australia as well quite remarkable. And indeed, forest certification is all about imports of protecting and enabling communities connected to those forests. So let's put some numbers on what impact forest certification and, and forestry actually has for people that work within the forest product sector. So if I can, Morgan, if we can move along to the next question, which looks at how many people are estimated to work in the forest products industry. If we have that, that'd be fantastic, if we have that close to hand. Fantastic. So, yes, it's not quite 15 million, but PFC International estimates that up to 14 million uh, workers are connected to the forest product sector. And forest certification, amongst other things, is all about protecting and preserving workers and communities within those forests as well. So our standards have strict requirements for occupational health and safety, um, wages and et cetera as well, which is relatively important. Um, and if you look, the next question I'd like to sort of jump to is the, the account of rural household income in 33 developing countries, which is quite interesting. So um, I'd like to get everyone's thoughts on this one. Now, it's rather interesting when we look at forestry and forest products that in the developed world, it's really a consumable product, but in the developing countries where a lot of the forest fiber around the world is circulated from, it is very much, uh, 
a matter of life and death and a, and a means for their for their for their livelihoods. And in this one, this is a bit of a curl uh, curveball because the correct answer is twenty one percent. So whilst it's not fifty or thirty, it's still a very important um, element to um, a lot of communities around the world. And and as Ben Gunnerberg, who is the CEO of PFC, indicated in the video. Uh, responsible wood and PFC is all around connecting communities and and lifting and enhancing livelihoods all around the world as well, which is really important. So I might jump through to the rest of my slides. So thank you everyone for participating. Uh, and if you have any other questions around um, that, please feel free to drop into the chat as well. Um, I've just got some. I've just got a question from Aaron, uh, which is roughly what portion of all harvested timber would fall under FSC and PEFC? And the correct answer is, I don't have that answer free of hand, but Aaron, I can find that for you. We do know that globally around 7% um, of um, global forests are covered under the PEFC scheme and around, I understand that um, the equivalent percentage from the 11 would be covered by FSC, which is around 4 million, 4%. However, I, not, I don't represent FSC, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but yes, it is a significant amount of commercial forestry around the world is, car car is carried by the PEFC scheme. Um, there is still a lot of um, timber that's circulating that isn't certified. Um, and part of our process at Response Board as a national governing body for PEFC is to try to lift the standard up and inform businesses around the importance of forest certification and to try to lift their procurement requirements as well. Um, so how does that relate to Australia? Um, well, that's a good question. So in Australia, 94% of, um, of, of commercial forest forestry is covered by the PFC or the Responsible Wood Scheme. Um, so what we find, one of the challenges we find at Responsible Wood is that the vast majority of forests are certified. Uh, forest growers are certified through our scheme. And that's really, when you look at Responsible Wood and PFC, that's where the, the much more labour intensive is involved in achieving certification. The primary processes are involved, the secondary processes, but the closer you get to the end user, um, often businesses actually disconnect or they don't actually follow through with chain of custody as well. So one of the challenges I have at Responsible Wood is to try to inform and provide education to, um, to, the, to the consumers at the, at, the, at, at the end of the supply chain to try to encourage um, more suppliers to actually engage with um, the PFC and Responsible Wood Schemes, because if they're engaged with PFC and they're recognising PFC as part of this, their procurement supply chains, it means that the, the likelihood of more legal timber is going through the supply chain as well, which is very important as well. So I might jump to the next slide as well, which I understand is another video. It's actually not another video. I might get to that video in a second. But we spoke before about the PFC Alliance and the global availability of timber. Now, this particular slide is from March 2020, so it predated a lot of COVID. Um, backlash across global supply chains. However, I can say that globally, PFC has actually gained in chain of custody certifications through the pandemic, which is quite interesting, actually. And I'm happy to talk through that in the, in the question and answer at the end as well. So around the world, 45 endorsed national systems like Responsible would exist. In many of those countries, they're known as PFC UK or PFC Spain or PFC Italy. But in Australia, we're known as Responsible Wood. Um, and of that, 53 national members that participate in the PFC General Assembly in Europe as well. So we, as the national governing body for PFC in Australia, we actually participate in the General Assembly where we vote on changes to an election of new members to the, to the family as well, which is really important. Globally, there's around 20,000 um, companies that are certified under PFC Chain of Custody Scheme. In Australia, we have around 300 um, businesses that are committed to the chain of custody scheme and businesses such as Fine Timber Tasmania in, in, uh, in Tasmania actually are, are, are encapsulated as part of what they call a group certification scheme, which is a way of actually getting like-minded businesses together and, um, and getting them certified under the one scheme as well, which is relatively important. So 325 million hectares of PFC certified timber around, around the world is covered under our scheme as well, which is relatively important. So the next slide actually looks at the global availability in a, in a in a more succinct way, and it looks at if you if you can if you can look at this further, it looks at the percentage of chain of custody certificate holders per country. Australia is quite an interesting place because um, we have the ninth largest forests in the world, and we're one of the largest forest um, 
you know, defined forest areas of all the countries around the world. Um, and due to our supply chains, um, we don't have the same level of chain of custody certificates that other countries have. So one of the challenges we face at PFC and Response Board is to try to lift the knowledge and understanding of, of, of chain of custody to ensure that people buying a product are actually getting a product that has a responsible or PSC logo on it to provide them with insurance that product is indeed from a sustainable forest. It's processed through the supply chains as well, which is very important. So we spoke about the importance of um, sustainable forest management. So those question and answers very much looked at, you know, the importance of forests, um, why they actually matter. Um, our standard known as AS4708 in Australia or PEFC ST1003, which is the Meta Standard for Sustainable Forest Management. Um, it has the principles of healthy forests, healthy communities and healthy workers. So through our standards, and I'm very happy to talk about this um, within the, uh, the handouts attached, um, you'll find through our standards, you see these principles of uh, the health and fertility of forests, the ecological important forest areas, forest conversions, avoiding genetically modified trees, illegal logging, um, well-being of forest communities um, and the fundamentals of the ILO conventions is very much intertwined in our standards as well, which is very important for how we operate. So I'd like to um, just go through a brief video, another video that looks at um, why forest certification matters and its, and its connection with Indigenous people in wholly dependent upon forests. So I might get more than just a jump You very much for that Morgan so I guess the real emphasis of, of that particular video is looking at PFC globally so responsible wood is the Australian standard so um, the Tasmanian forest fiber um, is very important for 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 the responsible wood scheme uh, but it's endorsed through PFC which provides its international credibility as well so which is very important so so PFC, which I spoke about at the start, is a global not-for-profit non-government organisation. It's one of the world's leading alliances for forest certification. Um, it was born from small family um, forest owners through Central Europe and has expanded around the world. Uh, indeed, Australia has played a very important role in the expansion of, response of PFC because we were the first scheme outside of Central Europe to be actually be endorsed by PFC. Um, which is quite an interesting thing. So over the space of the last 15 to 20 years, it's expanded through Northern, Northern America, through South America, through um, Central and Eastern um, Asia, Southeast Asia, and increasingly more into, uh, into new fields as well, which is very important. So um, another important part of PEFC and responsibility and how we develop our standards is aligning um, to this UN Sustainable Development Goals. And indeed, if you look at our standards, uh, we work very closely with the UN Sustainable Development Goals to ensure that our standards actually reflect the outcomes that has sort of been pushed forward through that through that process as well. So on to responsible wood in the Australian marketplace. I mentioned before the importance of forests in Australia. So indeed, pre-bushfires, we calculated that around 124.7 million of total forest area in Australia. And responsible wood is carried by 10.5 million hectares of Australian forests, which represents around 94% of, of, um, of the commercial forests in Australia. Um, 
as the only scheme that um, is, is is certified Australian architectural hardwoods and softwoods because of our uh, process of, of um, plantation and, and native forests that are covered by our scheme. If you're looking for the likes of Tasmanian oak, blackwood, uh, Hewan pine and radiata pine, um, it's important to look for the response wood logo because um, those particular species are covered as part of our scheme as well. So um, this is a really important part where we like to look at um, linking it back to the Tasmanian um, sense. So that responsible part of our part of our edit is to try to promote and encourage responsible forest management and aligning activities back to our standard. And recently we looked at the wedge-tailed eagle, which was a uh, particular program that Sustainable Timber Tasmania, which is the uh, the 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 forest grower in Tasmania introduced in order to protect and preserve the wedge-tailed eagle breeding. Um, and that process, and I'm happy to circulate that story with everyone on the story today, on the call today, was an important step in actually um, looking at preserving and meeting the biodiversity requirements as identified in our standard. So I'd like to just answer a few questions raised by uh, Megan and John in the in the chat as well. So does forest does responsible work with fire sticks? Now, not a hundred percent sure about that. I'll have to get back to you there, Morgan, uh, Megan, I should say. But I'm happy to um, to, to to chat about that with you after I get further re research offline. And for John, is PFC compliance criteria consistent consistent globally, or does it verify by jurisdiction and region? Now, that's a really interesting question because the way our process of endorsement and recognition works is that PEFC identify baseline environmental sustainable criteria, which it must be met from jurisdiction to jurisdiction in order to be endorsed through the PEFC scheme. But the way that responsible to PEFC works is that we are actually responsible for managing and developing a local standard, which is endorsed by Standards Australia. And that process, we can actually go beyond the jurisdiction for PFC. And often our document, um, AS4708, uh, particularly our new document, which I'd like to talk at the end of the, the presentation today, which is out for public comment at the moment, can actually go beyond the requirements of PFC. But PFC, and, um, the meta standard developed by PFC is the baseline requirement. Responsible develops a standard um, through a process of working with different groups, um, which act as working groups in the standard development process that can often go beyond that requirement as well. And in terms of where it sits in the global perspective, um, that's a really important question because PFC endorsement provides security that um, forest fibre that's endorsed from, from a different country meets those baseline requirements. But if you want to actually uh, meet the Australian standard for um, for sustainable forest management, you really need to look for that responsible wood logo. And Tasmanian fibre actually, if it's certified from a certified source and it's carried by a chain of custody, meets those requirements for the Australian standard as well. So responsible wood certification is always PFC endorsed, um, but PFC is not necessarily always responsible wood as well. So that's really important as well. So thank you very much, Morgan, for sharing that example of the wedge-tailed eagle um, in Tassie as well. So, um, and this is a beautiful, it's a beautiful little picture of that, of that, of that beautiful majestic animal. Indeed, it's actually the largest eagle I understand in the world. So, it's quite a remarkable story. But I'm talking to a group of Tasmanians, so I'm sure that you're all aware of that. So, you know, often when I give these presentations, I look at what are the drivers of forest certification, and they are they can be from a consumer, legislated, public procurement, private procurement, and often. What these could be, for example, is that the likes of the Australian Illegal Logging Act, it prohibits um, the, you know, importing fibre from a, an illegal source. Responsible and PFC can actually be used to justify and demonstrate the legality of that fibre at its origin, uh, public and private procurement requirements. We increasingly meet with um, private, um, private businesses to actually encourage them to procure in accordance with certificate, certified standards. Uh, and, in, and in public procurement as well, government is increasingly looking at forest certification, whether it's PFC, responsible or otherwise, to actually um, to provide, to lift the standard of, of government procurement as well. Um, oh, Mandy, interesting, we've got a few from Melbourne. Um, I'm, in, I'm actually originally from Melbourne as well, but I live in Brisbane, so <laughs> I saw the light and moved to the heat. Um, 
so so yeah so that that's a really important process of actually trying to raise awareness and certification from around the world as well so another well, interesting i've actually got some sydney and melbourne so some sydney and melbourneites on the call so i might have actually chosen the wrong project to showcase um but part of my role at responsible wood is actually getting out amongst the market finding out stories where they've used responsible wood or pfc certified timber in projects and promoting them through and writing articles and promoting them through different channels and, and an example of this was actually uh, uh, i think it's called a krakani lumai project in tasmania which was inspired by the constructions of tasmania's first people it was designed by taylor and heinz architect and it was actually a finalist in the 2019 world architectural festival in um, in the netherlands and indeed what's really interesting about responsible wood uh, and pfc is that we're very active in trying to promote certification through sponsoring a number of different design awards so in australia uh, responsible wood is the, the primary sponsor of the australian timber design Australian Certified Timber category of the Australian Timber Design Awards, um, which is a, a, an amazing event put on by the Timber Development Association in Sydney. Um, and globally, we we'll also um, sponsor the World Architectural Festival uh, Certified Timber category as well. So we've actually got an Australian Chief Judge on that, which is quite interesting. Oh, so Joshua, you don't think anyone from Tasmania is actually online? <laughs> well, I probably should have picked my audience a bit better. Uh, but we're all honorary Tasmanians because we all love going to Tasmania. So um, <laughs> I'm sure if they're online now, if they'll probably end up downloading this presentation and, and providing some feedback to me after, the, after the, the completion of that presentation. So this is an example of a Tasmanian project, which is actually possible as well, which is fantastic. So we are at a Tasmanian timber event. So it's very important that we promote um, the beautiful benefits of Tasmanian timbers. And another example is the Macquarie 01 Hotel, which was actually a finalist in the 2019 um, Australian Timber Design Awards as well. So it was designed by um, uh, an Australian designer and it's a, an iconic building in, in, in Hobart as well, which is very interesting. So I like to try to keep these presentations quite succinct because I like to, um, to really to get some question and answers and some feedback from everyone on the call today. But, what I'd like to leave you with some, some additional information. So first and foremost, um, Responsible Wood, we are here to serve you. We are a not-for-profit organisation. We do not charge um, to provide advice to you. So if you have any technical questions with regards to Responsible Wood Peace or indeed anything to do with forest certification, please contact me or contact Simon Dorries, our CEO, and we'll very gladly help and assist in, in trying to get where you want to go. Um, we are currently developing a new standard for sustainable forest management which will be the first trans tasman standard uh, which is the asnzs 4708 uh, principles of sustainable forest management so in the handouts today um, which is in the bottom part of the screen we actually have um, provided the draft copy of that document as well as a, a public comment page that you can fill out in so and provide back to responsible wood if you have any feedback about that particular standard and really the, the Australian standard or Australian and New Zealand standard for sustainable forest management is an important step in us continuing to lift the bar, uh, the borough for certification. And there's some very important um, features in that new document, such as the recognition of climate change and the impact on forest management as well. So it's a very important document and we'd love to get some feedback if you have any on, 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 on hand as well. So, and also I'd like to also mention that it would be remiss of me not to mention that um, when I'm chatting to architects and designers, it's really important to recognise the importance of specifications. And, and recently we've been in, con um, in contact with the lights of NatSpec to get AS470 recognised in the generic specifications. So if you have any questions with regard to specifications, please feel free to actually um, ask to, to send me an email, which will provide the details at the end of this, of this session and we can actually assist you in providing the right type of information to feature in your specifications if you wish to support the uh, AS4708 Responsible Wood Program as well. So, and that's a bit of information about the, uh, the new standard as well. Um, so there's been a, a, a range of updates from our 2013 edition. So an obligation as part of our endorsement process is to ensure that our standards up to date. So every five years we have to embark on this journey, which is a 
standard development process um, and it brings uh, groups together from both Australia and New Zealand, government, environmental groups, trade unions, growers um, and different independent stakeholders who get together in a room or over Zoom unfortunately because of the COVID and we discuss with each other how we're going to develop this standard in accordance with both the PFC standard and the expectations of the group as well. So. That particular program has been in the works for 18 months um, and it's been a journey that my boss has embarked on. Uh, I like to say it's a labour of love because um, it's, uh, it's been a weekly journey for him over the Zoom conferencing. And these are some examples of the different groups that are actually involved in that committee as well. So this might be some familiar names, there might not be some familiar names in there as well, but it's very much an Australian and New Zealand standard as well. And indeed Tasmania has a very important role to play in that and, and there are many Tasmanian voices that are um, very active in that, in that in, in those nominating organisations as well. So thank you very much guys. I noticed that I've got some, um, some questions on the chat, which I'd love to run through now. So um, I might just jump to Sandra, which is do you think that that in the future sustainable practices will be embedded into legislation and not just encouraged. Look, I really wish they were. Um, I'm not sure if they will be, um, but we're finding that increasingly government is looking at certification, forest certification as a requirement for lifting their illegal logging acts. So for example, Australia was one of the first countries in the world to actually introduce an illegal logging act. Uh, we've been working very closely with uh, the New Zealand government around um, ensuring that the provisions of the new standard encourages that as well. But we are challenging where we can the governments of both Australia and New Zealand and indeed through the, uh, the Oceanic region to really lift their, their, their requirements there. And there's some really interesting things happening in the private sector to push that forward as well. Climate change and the effect on forest management would be an interesting topic. Indeed it is. Um, and, in, and in fact, um, it was one of the most contentious topics in our new standard review. Um, and yeah, absolutely, it is, it is in fact impacting upon, um, impacting upon, the, um, upon the forests. And, and um, I'd love to share with everyone on the group today, but um, one of my recent mini series was looking at the Black Summer Forests in New South Wales. Um, and looking at the impact on the forest and the recovery mission there as well, which is really interesting. Um, Colin, thank you for, um, for, for, for enjoying the presentation. Who was the designer of uh, the architect for the Hobart project? Well, it was, um, it, I think it was the Circa Morris Nunn. Um, here it is here. Uh, and, uh, they were, and I've got a little quote from them as well. I've actually done a case study of that as well, Colin, so I'd love to share that with you um, as well. So it was Robert, Robert Morris Nunn from Circa Morris Nunn, and um, I'll, I'll provide that, pres uh, that little article to you at the end as well. And thank you, Michael, for coming in and jumping in and helping me out there by riding a shotgun. Uh, Joshua, are you finding that the perception that FSE slash PFC is changing? Um, well, that's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, I can't speak for FSC. Um, they run a very, very, a very good, robust scheme. I can only present the PFC case or the responsible wood case. But we are finding that more people are recognising to us that the PFC standard is improving, uh, particularly when you look at the likes of the sustainable, sustainability criteria and the benchmarks within the new standard. And we've had different conversations with different rating schemes and, and the like that have, that have been very favourable to our new standard development process as well. Um, but yeah, so that's, I can't really speak about the FSC because they run a fantastic scheme. And, um, and, um, and, and what they've done around to lift the standard of certification around the world is quite remarkable. Um, Gary, I'd have to get back to you on the, the, uh, the stipulation with the sustainable policies. Um, I'd love to get back to you on that. So I'll, 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 I might go back offline and, and provide you the information there. And then Shane, are you able to provide any information around the Tasmania Timber First policy for government projects? If there is one and how it's being managed and, and its success. Well, look, I'd love to. Um, I might actually leave that in the hands of the Tasmanian Timber Promotions Campaign as well, because I know they've been very working very actively around that. I understand that uh, PFC and Responsible is recognised within those requirements. Uh, and in fact, Tasmania has been a very strong supporter of our scheme as well, which is fantastic as well. And the likes of Fine Timber Tasmania has been a scheme around trying to lift and provide, um, I guess, more in, in that 
standard as well. Oh, okay. Sorry, Joshua. I'll read the question. <laughs> Sorry. Is it only by accident that we still have magnificent forest, despite only recently having that as responsible guides for forest management? Well, that's a. I mean, that's an interesting question, Trevor. Um, I can't speak for the past um, dues. Um, I guess responsible wood has grown from the Australian Forestry Standard, which has been around since 2003. But definitely our standard has strengthened and it's a lot stronger than what it was in 2003, 2007. And the current standard from 2013 is getting further strengthened in the new generation as well. So, um, yeah, so as I said, that's, that's quite an interesting process. So, um, yeah, so um, I might pass it on to Michael now because I can see he's jumped on the screen. Yeah, sorry, Jay. Yeah. Um, Jay, we, we can help you with that, Noel. If I can, uh, I'll, I'll grab uh, your details off Morgan, we'll forward you that information. There are several governments and states going and, and even local councils going to a wood preferred policy. So it is gaining momentum um, and it is gaining momentum along with the responsible wood. So yeah, yeah. It's an interesting question though about, about is it only by accident? We, we have had a reasonable, in, especially in Tasmania, we have had a reasonable conservation policy since, you know, sometime last century. But I agree with Jason that it's really jumped forward since 2003. So, yeah, radically different now from when I first joined the industry. Important, um, I guess, thing to recognise. So. From 1994 was the Montreal process, which was a really important step in recognising the importance of setting environmental benchmarks to protect forests for the long term. And really, PFC and Responsible Water is born of that process. So Responsible PFC was developed in 1999, so last year it had its 20th anniversary. Uh, and the AFF, which was the previous generation of the um, Responsible Water standard, was developed in 2003. So absolutely, the bar is definitely jumped, and we're finding more and more people are now asking. It's become a it's become a, a requirement to actually practice in the industry that you must be certified. Um, and I can I can say that the forest growers themselves, um, they employ people to manage their certification to the to the certification scheme. So, so we often I get asked the question, well, how does the um, how does forest certification work? It works, at, you know, you, you are certified for three years. Within that three year period, uh, a condition of the Australian Standard for Sustainable Forest Management to the Responsible Wood Scheme is that you must be audited four times in those three years to encapsulate seasonal variation. So you must be audited in summer, winter, autumn and spring through, through that process. And an audit for um, Responsible Wood, they must, uh, the auditor must visit the site. It's a, it's a week long expedition to actually go through and actually monitor and evaluate um, before they provide endorsement as well. So it's a really important step. Sandra, uh, so the industry is leading the push rather than compliance to legislation, they are behaving responsibly. That is great to see. Yes, and I think it is. Um, and I think, I think typically when you look at sustainability globally, I think business is now leading government. Um, so yeah, it's a fantastic step. Government, I must say government was involved originally with the importance of developing a standard, but industry is leading and, and pushing the standard to greater lengths. And I think that's a really important thing to recognise, particularly in the Australian and New Zealand context. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree with Jason on that. I mean, at, at the start of the process, government did lead the way, did provide all the funding and the infrastructure to start it, but industry has really stepped up and it's also interesting that, you know, we do a lot of work with furniture manufacturers and that, and that the, the awareness of chain of custody is becoming greater and greater. It's still a challenge right at the end, but a lot, a lot of, even those people, even some of the retailers are not buying unless they've got chain of custody to at least the timber uh, to the furniture manufacturer. So, yeah, it, it, it's gaining more momentum. I think it's really important to look at. So the, 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 the evolution of, of certification. So often two years ago when I started at Responsible Wood, a lot of procurement policies 
stipulated that they had responsible response uh, responsible wood at the at the forest level, but not at the chain of custody level. We're now seeing more and more retailers and and businesses in the supply chain enforcing and in, in, ensuring that the chain of custody is carried on that product as well, because it's not just enough to say that the timber is from a sustainable forest. You actually must ensure that it's actually being audited through the process and that um, those businesses are accountable for that choice as well. So it's not enough to say, well, the timber is from Sustainable Timber Tasmania. I have a certificate to say it's from there. You, really, you should also be pushing for chain of custody on the individual um, suppliers as well in the supply chain, because that's the only way you can really monitor and ensure that the timber you have is actually sustainable. Okay, on, on that, Jason, I'll just put in a bit of a shameless plug for Tasmania. Everyone you see on our uh, timber website, on, on the marketing website, um, are members and do have chain of custody with uh, with Jason's responsible wood. So, yeah, please be assured that anything you're getting out of Tasmania off the reputable dealers will come with a full chain of custody. Fantastic, because that is that that is ultimately the commitment of industry to really push that as well. And I think you know, talking to the design community today, I think it's really important that when you actually are looking for this information to challenge your suppliers and ask them, well, I understand it's China Custody certified, but I'd love to see a logo. So one of the things that we try to encourage is more businesses to use the responsible or the PSC logos on product, because it really, it's it's just a really, it can, it's just a really good thing to see to demonstrate that you're doing the, the right thing. And and as as Michael said, Tasmanian um, Timber is really leading the way on that. Um, all their members are China Custody certified, and that is a, significant commitment of those suppliers to commit to to sourcing timber through that program as well uh, because those individual members do get audited as well they get auditors on their sites they review their volume credits and they do all sorts of different things as well so it's a big commitment by the supply chain to do that and, and I would like to say another thing about that too is that often we get asked questions from and often through our, our help desk uh, architects and designers often ask as well I'm trying to do the right thing, but the supplier can't find uh, PFC or responsible certified timber. Now, in most instances, they can find it, um, but the particular person they're talking to may or may not know that they are sourcing that timber already sustainably, and it could be just a, a, an information breakdown. So, yeah, so as I said, if you have any questions about that, if you have any feedback from that, please feel free to contact me, and I'll try to assist where I can as well. Michael, I've got Trevor that's, that's asked a question uh, and I'll just read the question out so that we can answer it. So is there an element of begging the and encouraging a public to provide the resource and management of timber and thus the forest they're looking to buy? I think of the current discussion about the budding institution on wood products. And yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that we need to do as, as I guess, responsible participants in the industry. Um, we really do need to actually try to encourage where we can the public to ask more questions about certification and, and of timber as well. And, you know, I, I can't really speak on this forum explicitly about the Bunnings decision on wood products, but it's something that we need to work with. Um, and there are a number of different um, retailers that do the right thing, such as Bunnings, and enforcing responsible responsibility and certification as well. And that's a really important step as well. So. Um, so Bunnings are one of the members that really lead the charge with enforcing certification on, on forest products, which is really important, and it's a really positive step as well. Uh, so Sandra, I understand that part of the environmental products include transportation costs. Would sourcing responsible from Tasmania to be delivered to New South Wales meet this criteria? Absolutely it would. Um, um, and I think that's a really important thing. So, you know, one of the, one of the things that our standard doesn't look at um, which it probably, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a step above, is actually looking at the life cycle of a product and the importance of locally sourced product to, to reduce. So that's really where the responsible brand is quite powerful because responsible wood ensures that it's Australian grown and manufactured. And if you look at the global supply chains of timber across the world, a lot of timber is actually imported from overseas and it's all from a great forest because it's PFC endorsed and certified and it might be processed in a different country. But if you're looking at the strictly doing the right thing for the environment and sustainability, responsible we like to see is it's a mark above because it's ensuring that it's locally grown, it's supporting local businesses, it's it's from a local forest, it meets the Australian standard. And that's a really important step as well. 
So, um, so yeah, so that, that's a really important step that we can look to do as well. So, Sandra, if you have any questions further about that, I'd love to answer it as well. Yeah, Sandra, it is a great question because, you know, support local, buy local. Um, there's a lot of Tasmanian timber all up through Australia, but especially up the eastern seaboard. As, as I said during my presentation, we do not have a resource shortage at the moment. Uh, we do have a knowledge shortage. So part of my job and part of my can is when people to provide them the correct information so that they can find what they really want to see. Um, so, yeah. the end of our session today. Um, does anyone have any further questions they'd like to ask on the call today? And if you don't, please feel free to contact me either over LinkedIn or over through my email. My email's at the end of this presentation and um, I love to answer any questions. So um, please feel free to, um, to ask any further questions. Absolutely, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you like. That particular image was from last year at the General Assembly in Switzerland. So <laughs> it's a bit of an action shot. Um, Thank you, Diana, um, about being very interesting and stuff to think about. Um, and it's great that you're a hobbyist because um, timber is a fantastic industry. Um, I'm quite a new convert to the industry myself. Um, and what you can do with timber is quite remarkable. And you can connect with Mick there as well. Thanks guys so much for today. Um, I understand, Mick, that it's gonna be recorded as well. So if we've missed anyone from the call today, I'm they can, yeah. they can watch us yeah. at their own leisure we, as well. We can uh, provide you with a with a copy of this. That, that's for sure. And Jason, this this has been this has enlightened me on a few things. So I'm really great, especially around the the 1994 and and how that history came in. It really really does put things in context. Um, please, everyone, question if you've got any questions you think of in in the next period either jump on to Jason or myself. If, if it's about sustainability, I will say that I'll probably be sending them forward to Jason. If it's about <laughs> timber, please, please jump on. Remember our website, go and have a look for a bit of inspiration and in our suppliers. Remembering all our suppliers are, are audited. And one of the things that we do audit them on, even on the internal audit, is chain of custody and, and the Australian forestry standard, making sure that everything's in place. So. Yeah, please, please jump on and have a look for us. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Jason. Um, as mentioned, uh, we will have this presentation made available so I can send uh, a copy of it uh, for you after this presentation. And be sure to register for our next webinar. We've got another one coming up in October and it is a monthly series, so stay tuned. Um, you can also subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed um, and register for up and coming webinars as well. And like Jason and Michael mentioned, please connect with either of them on LinkedIn or via email and they are more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks to everyone, uh, on behalf of myself and uh, the Centre for Sustainable Architecture, it would be really great to see so many people on board and so many people stay through and thanks to Jason. Yeah, thank you very much and thanks everyone for, for engaging in so much conversation through the chat. I love it when I give these presentations and people talk because it means they're listening and, uh, and the more we can talk, the more we can, um, I guess, provide assistance to you and provide the right knowledge that you need to make the right decisions you can, um, the better we can do. So thanks everyone. And thanks so much to Tasmanian Tim for having us on the conversation today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for everyone for joining and we hope to catch you next month.